Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Nightlight, everybody. So glad you could join me again. I am so excited that we've got Gary Wayne here again tonight, and we're going through his first book, Genesis 6 Conspiracy, section by section. Now, this is a book that I have read at least three, if not four times, and I'm finding going through it another time, I am finding so much more information here that kind of adds to my own my own personal knowledge and of course brings up questions again in so many different places it's phenomenal and so it's it's been an exciting adventure we've been through his um second book genesis 6 conspiracy part 2 um going through section by section and they are all on my youtube if you want to dial those up and pay attention to those. That's a great idea because it gives you so much more information. It's unbelievable. Um, I I think that reading his books once a year is a really good education for everybody in, in so many different ways. It puts meat on the bones of the Bible, so to speak, in many different ways. Section three traces biblical evidence for surviving giants, establishment of their royal bloodlines, and their transgenerational conspiracy to enslave humankind through misunderstood and epic Old Testament events. It it brings a whole another light to the entire. I have to tell you that, that this last section of the book is, um, I, I have a couple of questions, actually. Um, you know, God is trying to wipe out the giants. But he's expecting the humans to do it. Why didn't God just kill them all? I mean, well, erase them all. I, I don't know how, how to put it. If he was so concerned about giants on the earth, why didn't he himself um, eradicate them? Question: Can you hear me now? It's a really yeah. good question. Yeah. So the Bible doesn't tell us why God doesn't wipe out the giants. Um, but... It sort of goes to the the wider understanding of how God operates and how he has set up a scenario that everything is done through free choice and free will. And everybody has a choice to do whatever they would like. And all the names that were written in the Book of Life from before creation will have an opportunity to leave their name in that book of life or have it blotted out. And so I think that goes to the angels and I think that goes to their offspring as well. So just as God did not prevent the angels from rebelling and just as he didn't instantly send them to the lake of fire and just as he didn't stop them from creating the giants, He's letting everything play out through free choice. So what happens through these choices is humans will either justify themselves through faith, 
to be resurrected in, in the in whichever resurrection you're part of, but for the resurrection of the saints and, and into eternity versus the second death, which is the Revelation 20 uh, resurrection. And the demigods are playing out their role as well. Will they continue to choose to follow their spurious celestial mafia godfathers or will they choose to reject that and follow God and the angels continue to convict themselves for the crimes that they do against humanity as all of these things sort of play out so God knows as Alpha Omega that they're going to create the giants he also knows that giants are going to be recreated after the flood and or some of them are going to survive or both And he knows this is going to be the case. And if they do survive, it's going to be through the efforts of the the fallen angels to protect their offspring. But nonetheless, even if giants didn't survive, which I tend to lean more towards, even though I leave a small crack open for the survival of the giants, um, they've recreated giants again after the flood. So just as God did not necessarily wipe out the giants himself before the flood he certainly permits the flood from happening and I think it's a choice there which is something that we can sort of overlay on what happens with the wars against the giants after the flood is that and as we talked about in the last show and probably the show before is this technology that was created by the antediluvians in partnership with the fallen angels had the ability to destroy the world by fire. But that is something reserved to the end time, as 2 Peter 3 talks about. Uh, And that um, the world was permitted to have a flood to start anew and to give a second chance and to buy time for the Adamites and all the names, if there are, that includes all the other sentient beings in in, in the Book of Life to have that opportunity. So in the polytheist writings, it's the gods who bring the flood, not the god of the Bible. And for some various reasons, uh, one of the violence of the giants, two, the humans are too noisy, and other reasons as well. (laughs) So God is letting that play out, but the flood is brought or permitted to be brought, but it doesn't wipe out all of the giants or there's, it doesn't prevent the second creation, but God knows this is going to happen. So the MO was likely that God permitted the flood, and the, it was the fallen angels that brought the flood, and that when we look at what happens after the flood again with these other giants, God, God could go and wipe them out, but he doesn't, because they are also having an opportunity to keep their names in the book of life or not. And so this is all being played out through that process right through to the end time. And this bloodline will go right through to the end time. So even in the Old Testament prophecy, we're told about these terrible ones and that that seed of that bloodline that's talked about in Psalms 21.8 is going to uh, survive, 21.8 through 11, is going to survive into the end time when then that seed line will be removed so this is just playing out it's part of the whole sort of process here so what god is trying to prevent is humankind from being wiped out so that they can reach their destiny he intercedes to do that and in terms of the nation of israel warring with the giants they're they are going to war with a lot of giant tribes but for the most part only the ones that are in the covenant land or the immediately surrounding area of the covenant land, not the other giants of the world. But but isn't there a loophole here? And this is what I don't I, I'm having difficulty wrestling with. God created um the angels and the humans in unconditional love. And that means that, that there are no conditions. You know, you can, you know, there's just no conditions. You are loved. And so he, he, he gets the humans to try to 
destroy the giants instead of doing it himself. I mean, it it just doesn't make sense to me. If 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 well, we're but, given... it's, but it's it's not it's it's not a whole a complete wipeout of the giants. It's only the giants that have illegally squatted in the land of the covenant, the land God reserved for himself and the land that God gifted Israel. They were laying in wait in ambush to wipe Israel from the face of the earth. That was why they were created. So giants will continue to survive outside the covenant land. They will survive in Mesopotamia. They will survive in Greece and wherever else the giants lived after the flood. It's just those ones that were in the covenant land were asked to leave. They refused to leave because they had settled there. And so there was a war and God was giving his reserved land. For people who aren't familiar with that sort of concept that they haven't listened to when I talk in other shows uh, about the council of the gods and the 70 nations, the land both before and after the flood in monotheism and in all polytheist cultures was divided amongst the gods. And it's that the uh, uh, Council of Nippur in Sumerian um, tradition, it was, you know, at the Council of, at Mount Olympus in, in Greek understanding, it was Mount Hermon in the Ugaritic text and the biblical understanding. And God reserved the land of the covenant for himself. The other nations were assigned to the gods or the fallen angels of the council to rule over. And that they would present their spurious offspring and give them to give them the divine right to rule, to rule over those nations of the earth. So when I say the giants illegally squatted the land of, of the covenant, we know as Israel today or the land of Israel, they were there and they understood exactly what they were doing and they were waiting for the nation of hope to come along and to wipe them from the face of the earth. Okay. It's just, I I think the the thing that, that is confusing is that, you know, God, God gave, the, the gods, the angels, sections of the earth, what did they need portions of the earth for if they were immortal? And, and you know, what did they need a plot of land for? Well, for some reason, the angels decided that they wanted to rebel and that they wanted to have earth as their realm and that they wanted to be able to be in physical form and walk amongst the humans in physical form versus their natural spirit form, and that they became even more corrupted. And so that was their choice, that for whatever reasons, they wanted to be able to have sex. They wanted to be able to eat. They wanted to be able to have people worship them. And they also wanted in that sort of state in the physical state, I think that's where they were demanding all of these sacrifices uh, that would give them the power through the physical aspect, but you could also make an argument that there's a spiritual act uh, part of that transference of that spirit through the worship to, to the fallen angels that they wouldn't need a physical attribute, but for whatever reasons, they decided they wanted to be in physical form. That's their, not their natural state. They have to artificially create that oiketarian which is a habitation or a house um, that is understood in Greek as a dwelling place for the spirit. And we would understand that as the soul and the body and that the spirit comes from heaven, just as the angels received their spirit from heaven. And then they artificially created their oikateri in the soul and the body. As humans are born into this earth, we have our own soul and body and our spirit that comes from heaven. And it goes back to heaven after we die and we go to sleep. And the spirit that went into the oiketarian of the giant's body, which was originally an immortal body until it was limited to 120 years in Genesis 6-3, so that both the immortal spirit counterfeited or Xeroxed from the fallen angels, the Nephilim of the Shemaim, that 
that physical body would not continue forever, that you wouldn't have a physical God in the physical world. There were restrictions that were put on at that point in time in Genesis 6-3 that the body would not, for God or demigod, continue to exist. And that's also why they were developing technologies that would protect that body. So when you hear of the golden fleece of, of Greek mythology in the Royal Masonic Order of the Anjou of the Golden Fleece. The Golden Fleece was the clothing, well, the clothing was made of that the gods would wear and what the demigods were also after to wear so that their bodies wouldn't decay or, or die. And one also speculates that maybe the sarcophagus, if it was a healing chamber, was also designed for that. So all we can say is is that we know the angels rebelled and they followed Satan and that they wanted a realm of their own. And it seems either they wanted the earth or they chose the earth as the place where they could have that realm for a period of time until the end time is completed. It's kind of like that movie Doctor Strange where you have this dark lord of the universe which is their allegory for uh, the god of the Bible and that all of these uh, seven science mages and wizards and superheroes are going interdimensionally and having this great war to win the realm and all they're trying to do is negotiate a peace treaty between the dark lord of the universe and in the movie so that they can have a place to live that's beyond the oversight of the God of the Bible. And I think that has a lot to do with they wanted to be able to physically interact and be worshipped like God, not by other fallen angels because they're all wanting the same thing, but by lower life forms, the ones that they created to destroy humanity from the face of the earth and not reach their destiny, and the humans as well. And, of course, the humans would have been the fodder for the, the human sacrifice in that worship. It just seems, you know, it, it, it casts the earth in such a different light. I mean, that, that everything is now corrupted, even, even down to, I mean, the societies that are created, like the Great White Brotherhood. Um, one would have thought that the Great White Brotherhood would have been the good guys, but apparently not. I mean, it, it, it really... It makes humanity out to be almost like cannon fodder in this war. We are, but our destiny is there for us to choose, and we are the resolution to the angelic rebellion. Now, when they call themselves the Great White Brotherhood, they don't look at themselves as the evil ones. They look at themselves as the good ones. They look at Christians and Jewish people and Israelites, at the one time, or at the time when there was two nations, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, they look at them as the evil ones. So they look at themselves as, as the children of light, and knowledge is light, and that's what they say. They're trying to free humanity and their, uh, the offspring of the giants from ignorance and freedom, and just as Satan masquerades as an angel of light he originally was an angel of light and that all of his followers and ministers and angels who follow satan also masquerade as ministers and angels of light so they call themselves in those terms and they look at themselves as being like the rebels in star wars and of course the uh the dark ones the dark force is the forces of the bible in that allegory again and so that's that's how they look at things. So it depends on which side of the fence that you're on, whether or not you're looking at who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. But also understand what's kind of unique within polytheism is, is they have that same dualism within their culture, within their religion, within their uh, their empires and their realms, that you have good magic and you have black magic, and you, you have good Nephilim and you have evil Nephilim and you have evil witches and you have good witches and on and on. And, and we would know it today as the white hats and the black hats. But in that belief system, it's still polytheism and they still have the same agenda, just a different way of getting there. 
uh, and where the black hats would wipe humankind from the face of the earth instantaneously, the white hats would say, no, we need them and we want them uh, to achieve our goal, uh, which is ultimately to have a showdown with the God of the Bible and to include humans in that battle as part of the rebellion, and then to um, achieve godhood and a realm with their gods away from uh, the God of the Bible. So we have to understand that if, you know, as Christians, from my perspective, is we can't come at people of other belief systems and, and call them evil if we want them to have a look at what we do. Uh, and why we believe what we believe and what's in the Bible. We need to be more inviting for them to give Christianity and the Bible a look, not be trying to be like, uh, you know, those old stereotypes of a Baptist minister reigning, you know, (laughs) death, fire, and judgment, right? It's like... (laughs) Um, that's not that's not what we're here to do. We're here to role model, and by our role modeling, have people want to join us because they say that's the right way to live. That's the right way to do things. And who who and what you believe in must have truth in it. And so you you can't. And, and I would say this to any side is you can't get good from evil. You can't get lie, uh, truth from lies. You have, you can't get love from hate. You just can't, you have to, you have to be more of what you're trying to represent. And that even though Jesus has both a priest and a warrior aspect of him, of, of, of his nature, and as what we will see in the end time, when he does step in to defeat those bloodlines, they are above us. They are Alpha and Omega, Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit and and uh, God. Um, we are not there. We are not there to do that. We are here to figure out why we're here and to try and learn as much as we can and to leave our names in the book of life because that's our gift. That's our opportunity. So so at creation, the book of life had everybody's name really written in it already. Does that mean from the beginning of time to the end of time that my name and your name might or might not be there? It is not taken out till, um, <clears throat> until after we die or after... The- the judgment or the resurrections and depending on where where you fall into there. So um, God knows how people are going to choose. It's not fate because it's left up to us to do it. So it's destiny. So uh, those you would look at those names as still being there. But as we move into the resurrection sequence and into the millennium and, and on, then those names will be blotted out from the book of life. That, gotcha. didn't, that that weren't resurrected into eternity. It just it just it feels like humanity as a whole is being pulled into a battle that is not theirs. Yeah, it's 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 not that we're an afterthought on the creation. It's how God I think saw it right from the beginning, Alpha Omega. If I create a physical universe. Uh, no, that's, I'm getting that out over. If I create these uh, immortal spiritual beings we know as the angels or as the gods um, in polytheism, and then you create the physical universe, uh, he knew at that point in time, even before he created them, and one presumes angels are in the book of life as well because they're living immortal beings, is that he knew which ones would eventually rebel. And yet he still created them. But the only way to get to a point where you're having people who want to follow God and understand the gift that's given to them is to let this thing play out and self-weed itself, so to speak. It's, It's very painful for us to go through, particularly humans, things that we've 
suffered the wrath of the fallen angels ever since our creation. But that's how we get from point A to point B. And that's which is why we will be raised up higher than angels in eternity and that they will serve us in eternity. And we are the inheritors of eternity because we were created lower than angels. We were created without all the knowledge that the fallen angels have. We were not created immortal and that we have very little knowledge. So we have to choose on faith. And that's why faith is what gets us through versus works. Now, I think if you have the spirit in you, you're going to do good works. So I think they're kind of interconnected. But in the New Testament, the doctrine is, is that it's faith. And whether it was faith of Abraham in in God and Jehovah, um, that's El Elyon and Jehovah uh, of the Elohim. Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, that was still faith that's recognized as a saving them. But isn't this what started the battle in the first place? If in the end humans are raised above the angels, isn't that what created the rebellion with Satan saying he wasn't going to bend knee to anybody other than God? Well, some some people say that, but I think that does not properly date when the rebellion had happened. So Satan had fallen and rebelled, as he's recorded in in uh, Isaiah 14 and in uh, Ezekiel 28, at a time that was, as we link in other passages, would be before Eden. In fact, he is trying to call, he is trying to bring down the downfall from the creation of Eden because he's already been rebelled. So Jewish, Jewish traditions has that rebellion somewhere in days one through six. And I think certainly before the Eden account, um, the rebellion happened. I might even place that rebellion between Genesis 1, 1, and 2, and I think it's a better place for it. So I would look at the world um, that Adam was put into was already corrupted by the fallen angels. And in this case, I look at and I write about in book one and talk about the people of day six versus the Adamites. And this is a separate creation um, that I, you know, I won't go into the whole litigation of it unless we want to dig into it deeper, uh, that the description of the Eden account is at complete odds with the description of the day six people. And so there's no day eight. And so sometime after day seven, you have the Eden account. And I think the people of day six were corrupted and were all followers of the fallen angels. And then you have this Nahash set of beings that are created as the beast of the field, as they're described in Genesis three, and probably at the beginning of day six, in terms of a day is a thousand years, again, as that terrific passage in two Peter three, is describing for us to help us understand prehistory and prophecy uh, that a day is a thousand years uh, for humans for a day of God. And that if that's the case, and it wouldn't say it if it wasn't, then you would have had possibly a thousand years of the Nahash or the serpent. That's the Hebrew word for serpent race that was intelligent, walking, talking, and also followers of Satan. And as you look at that word Nahash, you take it back to its source word, it means like a words like necromancer and sorcerer and all words that would describe polytheism and the priests of polytheism that would worship the pantheon of the gods. So that would likely suggest that there was corruption that went on before that. And people will say, well, but sin entered the world when when Adam was created. That's true, but as the book of Romans talks about is that you do not have uh, the law applied and held accountable until there is the law. And there was no law that was established before Adam. And with Adam, there was only one law. And they, Adam and Eve violated that one law, not to eat from the tree of knowledge of both good and evil. And that's when sin and entered into the world. So all the other things that were happening with the fallen angels, 
uh, were not part of the human law, and the human law was not created and set down in stone, so to speak, as it was with Israel, um, um, with the people of day six. So it was not imposed. So that sin was not there when you don't have the law to impose it. So, so basically, Adam and Eve were put on the planet basically to create a messianic bloodline where the Messiah can be born into. Yes, that's the, what I would call the messianic promise or the messianic plan, and that the fallen angels even knew that that was going to happen. But they didn't have all of the knowledge, and we know this because they didn't know about a resurrection. And even in the time of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when Jesus was there, there was this huge debate amongst the Sadducees and the Pharisees, was there a resurrection or not? And uh, most at that time, I think, probably believed that there likely wasn't and that they have these other sort of mythologies um, where they would be like in a, in a um, state um, that is neither alive nor dead and not in the sleep nature that they were taught, but that's because they're trying to fill in the void themselves. So Abraham's bosom is just sort of a parable as it's, and it's not fact. It was just a common belief at that time. And it's the meaning of the story that's more important there because there's always a moral moral to these parables. So, And so they didn't understand the resurrection. They didn't know about the resurrection. And had they known about the resurrection, as the book of First Corinthians talks about, the princes or the archons who ruled the world, those are the fallen angels, just as Satan is the god of this world, and just as he's also the prince of this world, and just as he sits above this council of the gods that rules over the 70 nations of this world for a short time longer, if they knew and understood that if they killed the Messiah, that he would be resurrected, and he was the perfect atonement for the sins of the world, being without sin from the time of his birth until he died and was the creator of this world, if they had known about the resurrection, it clearly says from a Christian perspective in the book of Corinthians that they wouldn't have had him as had him crucified. So they didn't know about that. And then in first Peter three in first in the book of first Peter, I think it's chapter two or chapter three, Jesus, while still in the grave, he actually goes to the pit prison to the fallen angels who were put into those prisons for the crimes against humanity, for the violations against the laws of creation. And, you know, the ones who created the giants would be a classic example of ones, and there's probably other ones there as well that uh, would have had some sort of violation against the, uh, the um, excuse me, against the Holy Spirit. So, like, Establishing yourself as a mother goddess is a violation against the Holy Spirit. So that might be another reason why the angels would would be there. So all of the goddesses would be uh, subject to that same sort of punishment to go to the pit prison while awaiting to go to the lake of fire. So they didn't know about that. But what they were hoping is two things. One is, is that they wanted to ensure whatever God's plan was is it wasn't going to succeed. So you take out the one that's there to bring the plan. And the second thing is is that they're, what they're trying to do all the way through is to wipe humankind from the face of the earth and to rebel uh, against God so that they do not reach their destiny. So, yeah, we are sort of the fodder in the mix but we are what this world is all about and what it's going to be about going forward. It it calls to wonder if that's the story for this world. God created everything. So there have to be other worlds as well that that he has created that that probably sustained life and forms of life such as us. Is this is this a process that 
all worlds go through, or is it just for the earth? Yeah, and we're not told that biblically, so you could sort of surmise both ways, but I think you want to be careful, though, um, that we don't want to, I would say you would want to be careful from a, from a Christian perspective not to supersede the linear nature of this world. Um, and that within the physical world, like a planet like Earth, and saying because the universe is not measurable, whatever the size it is, that there would be other worlds like that. But to say that there were other worlds before us, we don't get that. And we don't get that there would be other ones that would be inheriting eternity with us. So by inference, I would go for this linear nature uh, that the Bible is talking about. And when we are resurrected into um, <clears throat> eternity and after there's a new heavens and a new earth, and heavens can mean a new uh, place where it has three meanings. And one, it can mean where the angels and God dwell today. It can mean what's inside the permanent, that's the sun inwards as the permanent is described as heaven in Genesis 1. And also it can mean what's outside the permanent. So could there be the ability to hold life outside the permanent? Biblically, you can make that case as yes. And that we know there is that universe outside the firmament. So we know that that's a possibility. And that in our future, would we be participating in life forms that are being, or sentient life forms that are going to be created down the road? Or will there no longer be more sentient beings created, but just normal sort of life as in, you know, mammals and things like that, but not to the level of, of, of humankind and, and to the angelic realm. We don't know, but one deduces we would have to be doing something in eternity. If we look at what the angels were doing, were they just involved with the earth or were they involved throughout the universe um, before the rebellion? And are they still involved throughout the universe in preparation for what's coming? Um, I would say part of that would be true is, is that uh, the angels were certainly working in their trade, just as Satan has described working in his trade throughout the physical world, the universe, um, before pride took hold of him and he rebelled. And so I think we'll be doing something like what you were referencing um, in, in, in the future time. It would make sense that God just wants to create more life, and this is the first sort of process where we can move into a point where this is why things have to be the way they are. So when we create life, they're going to choose and they're going to have the laws written on their hearts, probably like we will be when we are um, resurrected, because it's the only way that we're going to be able to follow God because both immortal beings and mortal beings rebelled against God. So that's why God tells us going forward with our new immortal bodies, and into eternity and bodies like Jesus because we're adopted by Jesus as our as his brothers that we will also both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament that God will write his laws upon our hearts that will help guide us into eternity well you speak of other dimensions with you know heaven and hell and and stuff like that so so could there be other dimensions again going through the same process? I it just it seems to me that that we are we are so teeny in the grand scheme of things that we're part of a puzzle. But I'd love to know what the puzzle is of. Yeah, and it's and it's likely you know a greater puzzle than what you know we could sort of ever kind of imagine whether or oh, yeah. not it is as large of a puzzle as what science postulates with um, basically an infinite amount of physical universes. Um, we don't know, but what we do know from what science has been able to discover is, is that there are some dimensions. 
Now it just gets down to how many different dimensions. Biblically, we're only told about three, um, but that doesn't mean there aren't others. We're just told about three. Now, some people would say seven from a polytheist perspective, um, but those other four are generally uh, accounted for within um, the two lower heavens uh, that is referenced as other heavens in polytheism. Gotcha. So, <clears throat> so the angels corrupted everything. And you know, the Bible speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah, and yet, um, and, and actually, I did not realize just how corrupted they were. But it wasn't just them. It was, it was many cities on the plain, um, which I found fascinating. And haven't they actually today, well, not today, today, but in this time frame, haven't they actually found rocks that have been crystallized and, and, and sort of burned into glass that would suggest that there were massive um, nuclear nuclear like explosions that took place thousands of years ago yeah i do i i do believe that that's the case and i do believe that that's part of the understanding of sodom and gomorrah and that there were five cities of the plain uh, and a pentapolis city state and a very powerful pentapolis as as we talked about in book two in detail in terms of the standard formation of how giants and hybrid giants form their military defense and offenses from a, a Pentapolis military state or a five city state of high walled fortresses and villages, either walled or unwalled in, in between, which are known as the Hazarim. And so <clears throat> this, this uh, place called Sodom and Gomorrah, it was destroyed in a way that is kind of unique as it's described biblically from a, a, a prehistory perspective. We don't get kind of another similar account until you get to the end time where that's reserved for that destruction by fire. And we have that technology that could destroy the world by fire and with that nuclear technology. So it would be some sort of uh, description that would be very close to that as being that same kind of technology um, only this comes from God so it could be asteroids or it could be you know techno technological weapons that are being being used there and who knows we might get both of that in in the end time what's interesting about Sodom and Gomorrah as well is that in Luke's account when he gives the uh, records the rendition about Jesus's oratory of the end time signs. He's talking about the days of Noah and Mark and Luke, that it's going to be like the days of Noah as part of the three overarching signs, fig tree generation and sorrows are the other two. But Luke connects that with a transition, which is very important for understanding end time prophecy. And one of the reasons why I start off book two with the, uh, um, the days of Noah, what that means um, as it connects into to, to Luke, the book of Luke with Sodom and Gomorrah as the transition. And that's because, as, as I mentioned earlier, earlier, and it is my speculation that the world was spared from the angelic technology controlled by the giants before the flood to destroy the world by fire, to accomplish the goal of their creators and to rise out of the ashes in a new world like the phoenix out of the ashes um, in secret society uh, rituals um, to live in a world where their gods are, that their gods would renew the earth again, um, for this time um, without the help of the Holy Spirit or without the Holy Spirit doing it, but the angels would do this for their offspring to live in. So, that's why it's important to understand the Sodom and Gomorrah allegory as part of the days of Noah that, that is presented in the book of Luke because that's the judgment that's reserved for fire in the end time. And the Balim were the gods of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Balim are the gods that created the Raphaim after the flood. 
in the second incursion from the Canaanite pantheon perspective. And the council of the Baalim that rules from the council of the gods at Mount Taphon, which is Hermon in the Bible, and also Sion, Sinir, and Shinir, all names for the same place. And Mount Hermon is a name that's replacing those other vernacular names because Haram, uh, and it's two variations, means cursed and accursed. And this was the place where the fallen angels swore their oath of harem anathema to create the spurious offspring, to destroy humankind from the face of the earth, and to establish their oath-based legal system. And that this is the place where Sodom and Gomorrah would do their worship to. So Baal and and Nat, the mother goddess, are the two more prolific creators of giants after the flood. So both before the flood, you have angels walking amongst humans and creating giants with the Nephilim. And then after the flood, you have the parent gods taking over because El was the parent god of the Canaanite pantheon before, also talked about in the Ugaritic text. He's now gone to the pit prison for his crimes at the time of the flood that God sentenced them to. The offspring gods, out of spite, do the same crimes as the parent gods did, and they're going to disappear as well and go to the pit prison. So you have this beautiful sort of transition of understanding what's going on between prehistory and end time prophecy and we need to learn the lessons that giants and the watchers and fallen angels walked amongst us as gods both before and after the flood just as noah lived 350 years after the flood and 600 years before the flood and that sodom and gomorrah in the polytheist accounts were known as cities of light not cities of evil and that there are shining cities on a hill. And that Gomorrah, as recorded in the Holy Book of the Invisible Spirit in chapter 74, or chapter 66, is um, was the first incarnation of the creation of giants before the flood. And then after the flood, that's, that second seed was replanted this time in Sodom. So these are antediluvian cities that survived the flood, just as Uruk and Ur and all of the cities of Sumeria survived the flood and were likely renovated by uh, both uh, the Sumerians and some cities like um, Nimrod, because Erech, E-R-E-C-H, is a transliterated form of Uruk. For, for the biblical application in Shinar or Sumer. And that what is also important to understand is that these are considered giants akin to Amaka Set, who has three incarnations. And just as the giants have uh, incarnations, they have an incarnation as being created before the flood and then again after the flood, and then a, a reoccurrence in the end time again. So just as the Bible tells us to learn about the days of Noah, both before and after the flood, up to the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, it is um, told in the Gnostic accounts as well, in that it tells the same story, but from a polytheist lens. Now, what's going on at Sodom and Gomorrah is not just a polytheist sort of uh, epicenter, but you're also having all forms of crimes that are um, being done and crimes that will be listed in the laws of Israel when they're given the laws not to do this because the Canaanites and the giants had done those crimes before them and defiled the land and they were not to defile the land. So all sorts of violations, sexual violations, um, ritual uh, that we're doing violations like human sacrifice and blood drinking and things like that. But also you could look at the language that is being talked about in Sodom and Gomorrah as having this sex with angels is you might interpret that not as intergender sex, but as interspecies sex. 
And when you see the accountings in, in um, Jude and uh, First Peter and in Second Peter, where it's making the reference to the giants, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the flood and the crimes, this is a strange flesh that is being talked about where you're having this sex between. I won't go through the whole story, uh, the whole um, minutia of, of the Hebrew words on this, but understand that means a different species, a different race. Uh, so you can interpret that as intergender sex or as interspecies uh, sex or interrace sex. In this, be, in this case being that the two men who weren't first recognized as angels by Abraham, who accompanied Jehovah, who also took the form of a man and who had that physical oikotarian that they created to interact, they, the two angels are now sent over to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that they're recognized as angels come to judge. So angels in their body form can be recognized or unrecognized just as Hebrews 13 tells us to be careful and nice to strangers lest we run across an angel unaware. But clearly, the people of Sodom understood these two humans, or angels in human form, as being angelic and that they were there to judge the city and that they were wanting to have sex with them. Now, it's not clear from the language whether or not they wanted to have sex with them as male to male or they wanted the angels to take a female form or were they saying we're going to provide our daughters to these angels to create new giants because they were governed over by Raphaim who worshipped the Baalim who created the Raphaim so they had this knowledge that they had the capability of doing this and the Raphaim by this time have a clear fertility issue that is affecting them, which is the inability, I think, as it's manifested in that infertility, the inability to create female giants, which is limiting their ability to reproduce. And they have to reproduce with humans thereafter and create the hybrids like the Canaanites uh, who are intermarrying with the Raphaim to create the Canaanite hybrid race that they're ruling among. So you probably have some Canaanite humans there, you have Canaanite hybrids, and you also have Raphaim giants all in that mix at the five cities of the plain. And everything they did, because the Canaanites moved to the land of the covenant to live amongst the aboriginal giants who were there from early on after the flood. Babel happens at 101 years after the flood, so they're moving into live amongst the aboriginal giants and that um, they are going to be fully immersed into the religion of the giants and the worship of the celestial mafia godfathers of their demigod kings. Well, didn't, didn't I know the crowd were saying they wanted to know the visitors and were they offered um, the daughters you know, instead, and they said, no, no, we want the strangers. Yep. We want to know yep. them. Yeah. So, yeah. But, and, so, but another, another because, thing. Because if, the daughters wouldn't, because, because the daughters wouldn't produce any God. Well, but the thing is, what, what I don't understand, knowing that having so, sex with, with these gorgeous angelic figures is going to produce a giant or a monster who would volunteer for that i mean that first of all didn't it kill most of the women when they when they gave birth exactly and yet we know that before the flood they went to uh, many times to picking wives that they chose to create giants in many ways we're not told how many ways after the flood, and as we talked about when we were covering book two, is that after the flood, you have Canaan, who is going to receive the curse of Ham, um, who is not going to live in bondage. The other sons don't receive the curse of Ham, and Canaan isn't the one who causes the crime against Noah. 
uh, that the curse is derived from. It happens to an unborn Canaan at that point in time. And I think he's the one who produces uh, daughters uh, who will intermarry with the uh, with the uh, Baalim gods to start recreating the Raphaim afterwards. But Canaan could also, and I don't think I mentioned this in, in, in book two, but just the logic of it is, is that Canaan could also have intermarried with a goddess to produce giants as well. And so that would be another reason either or why they were so interested to go back after Babel to live amongst the giants because they were the ones who provided uh, the males and or the females or both uh, to the fallen angels to create the giants after the flood. Well, uh, I think you know, Nimrod probably, I think Nimrod probably also intermarried with uh, a female goddess or other female giants to create his royal bloodlines as it comes down to the Sumerian tradition. I mean, you in the book go back and forth so many times I lost count on was Nimrod a giant or not. And, you, you know, you you had, you know, good evidence for both. Um, you know, was he a giant or was he not? I mean, they followed him. He was the leader. He was the king. Yep. He he was the yep. sponsor, the creator, the be that he he wanted the tower built so that he his throne could stand higher than God's or as high. Uh, among I mean, that's one of the reasons that was given, and, and another was that he wanted to kill God because he destroyed everything with a flood. So. Yep. It, it 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 makes it confusing as to what and who he actually was. Yeah, I, I do land uh, um, in that section on the word gibberim as for sort of the um, dividing of all the different accounts of Nimrod because he's known in multiple cultures, right? And so depending on what source you're reading, is he a giant or isn't he a giant? From a Christian perspective... He's called a mighty one uh, before God, and the Hebrew word gibor and gibberim as being um, uh, the, the, the word that would translate into mighty one. And so gibor can mean a giant or a description of a giant. So it's not necessarily clear in the passage there what, what's being referred to if you just sort of stop there and in the and in the uh, ugaritic text which uses original semitic that hebrew comes out of which is why i thought was such a beautiful parallel to use uh, a lot in book two is that the word gbr is the vowelist semitic uh, word for gibor and gibberim is the male plural versus gibbera as the female plural um and gbr was used to describe the mighty raphaim uh, giants in the Ugaritic text, but also used to describe one specific race of giants called Gibberim as part of the assembly of the Datanu. So we do have Gibberim translated as giant one time in the King James Version Bible in, in the book of uh, Joshua, uh, and people can decide whether or not uh, that is a giant or, or not. Um, as it's uh, translated as giant could mean just a, a mighty warrior but it could also mean giant as well there based on the information that I provided so he became gibbering which is a very interesting way of describing him and we also have well, wait, his what, lineage from the patriarch it, it? which is Cush oh, just, I'll, I'll finish it quickly okay. here um, so we have that showing that he's likely human who became, which is the language, which is, is, is the Hebrew chalal, and which means he became that way through rituals and sexual rituals and other things and breaking vows. So somehow something changes with him is what the Bible is, is telling us, even though he has a human father, which is typically not the definition of a giant, but um, if... 
if uh, Cush had married uh, a, a mother goddess, which was his father, and produced Nimrod, then you could probably get to a giant that way. But again, biblically, we're not told that. So how I come down on it in book one is, is uh, as I lean against him being a giant, in fact, I say I think he's human, who married into the giants, and that you could be called, uh, a giant can be called gibberine, and a uh, human can be called a gibberine as well as a mighty one, just as David's mighty men were called mighty ones, but a human cannot be called a giant, and a gibberine could be understood as a giant. Um, so the difference is, is that humans aren't giants, and the gibberine can, can describe both. Um, so that's how I sort of separate it to say I think that he's human where something changed with him after his rebellion against God. So why was, well, I know they were sent down and told to disperse, and they stayed all together, he and his followers. And that's that's when he decided to, to build the tower. Why did he build the tower? Was he was he trying to get to heaven or to, to where God was? Was he trying to, you know, you had so many choices there. I mean, it was said that at times yep. he would shoot arrows into the air to try to tell God he yep. was coming. So yeah, yeah. Why? So it's a, it's an interesting story, and and you know how could you build mud bricks into heaven? <laughs> you just physically couldn't do it, and you and you're not going to be able to shoot arrows and kill you know the God Most High. So there's more obviously going on there than what's uh, sort of at the superficial understanding. And so when they came down from the mountain, God did tell them to disperse, and they did not because they were fearful. And not only did they choose a leader or Nimrod usurp power, either way is you know possible from a biblical perspective. Legends would say that he uh, usurped power and took control, became an evil tyrant. Um, and so they built a city, which is really kind of strange after, and, you know, this is, again, less than 100 years after the flood. This is before the dispersal uh, and how many decades it was taking to build the city and the tower. They built this city, and the city was built for protection both before the flood and after the flood, and with high walls. And they didn't disperse because they were fearful of something. Well, and they were fearful that they would be white. They, would, they were fearful that they would be white from the face of the earth. So they clung, they clinged together at Babel City and Babel Tower. They were afraid of the aboriginals. They were afraid of the giants that were already there. And so, or shortly thereafter that they were afraid of, um, that they were produced shortly after the flood. Either way is fine by me, but I lean towards them being um, created after the flood and very quickly after the flood, after Ararat. And so um, they're building the city, and you can't build the city into heaven. And so... That's the only way that somebody could kill God is to go into heaven and, and slay God, is, is what he was saying in the polytheist accounts. And so if you understand Babel as the confusion of languages, you have no idea what's going on. But the Akkadian versions and the Babylonian Sumerian accounts of the Tower of Babel uh, not only include giants, just as the Central American accounts of Babel include giants helping to build the tower in the city as well, which is another, not in the Bible, but some interesting sort of context to who they might have been also afraid of. And that's who the Septuagint said that Nimrod earned his reputation against, was warring against the giants, which is why he became king. They were... Obviously had knowledge to build the city, 
and to build this tower. And one would have to deduce that Noah kept this knowledge and provided that to him. But again, biblically, we're not told that. But from the well, Masonic accounts, from the Masonic accounts, is that Hermes finds this antediluvian knowledge and takes it to Nimrod that had the ability to build the great cities of the antediluvian epoch and to destroy the world from the knowledge that merged with the seven sciences. And they use this knowledge to build Babel City and Babel Tower. And we're told in the account that even working as one people, if they worked as one people, nothing they intended to do going forward would be prevented from them doing. And this is an indication of the knowledge. And from the Akkadian account, Babalu is the equivalent for Babel, and Bab means a gateway or a portal, and I-L would be the transliteration of E-L for a god or an angel. So this now becomes Babel Tower is this technology that is a portal or a gateway to the gods. That means you could go interdimension. So now you could go into Sheol or Hades and release your gods that you're worshiping because he imposed Enochian mysticism on the uh, Noahites when he had reign over all the Noahites uh, at that point in time. He was like an, an archetypical antichrist type figure and that um, he would also have the ability to go into heaven and that is something reserved only for Antichrist. Although there will be Antichrist figures like Nimrod all the way through that want to go into heaven to slay God, as the polytheist accounts say that he threatened to do if God got out of line again, only Antichrist will be permitted to do that. And that happens at the midpoint of the last seven years. That's recorded in Daniel 8 through 10. Uh, Daniel 8 verse 8 through 10, and in Revelation 12, where you have the war in heaven. And at that time, Antichrist will actually throw down some of the starry hosts, some of the angels, the loyal angels, and trample on them in this war in heaven, as it's described in Revelation 12. Well, that makes more sense, because, you know, it says basically God came down and saw the tower and didn't want them to to reach to heaven, and so he changed their languages, but if what they were creating was a portal, that makes great sense. And it, it has to be something like that, because again, even if they were using great technology to raise huge stones, you still couldn't build it and get into heaven. There would have to be a technology associated with it. And most of the great megalithic sites that were created both before and after the flood, uh, to the gods, had domains, which is a portal. And many of them, multiple portals. Um, so this is a standard in the religion that and the knowledge that Nimrod would have received. And he writes the first constitution for the secret societies after the flood. He's the first grand master of royal masonry after the flood. He initiates a thousand masons, according to uh, the Gnostics and secret societies at Babel, to build Babel City and Babel Tower from the knowledge that he gets. So it may be that antediluvian knowledge that was also used to make uh, Nimrod a gibbering. Again, I'm speculating there because I don't have that from a biblical perspective or a polytheist source that it was the DNA manipulation or something else that was enhancing his power. What is the time frame difference between this creating the first grid mason and the time of Solomon when masonry becomes a little more common whatever? Yeah, about 13 to 1400 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, I mean, you've got Solomon that's going to build uh, the temple between about, you know, 940 and 1000 um, BC on biblical time, and the biblical chronology would be, um, you know, 2350 for the flood, 2348 is Anumunde, Babel is 101 years after the flood. And 
you know, you, you would move that back, you know, 600 years using um, secular chronology. Um, so, but either way, you still get the same spread. Well, it takes it, it. It changes the understanding of masonry to a great to a great extent as well. Yeah, yeah, it does, and the, and the history of it, let alone going back to before before the flood, and so all of the superficial things that we learn uh, through Freemasonry that they take a lot of the roots back to uh, drafting King Solomon as a black great black magician or magi of, of their belief system and associating that with the building of the temple. What happens there is that King Hiram uh, sends uh, Hiram a beef uh, to Israel with the knowledge to build the temple and to teach uh, the uh, Judeans the knowledge of building and all of the things for great palaces and for great temples. And this is the knowledge that's inherited down to the king of Tyre through the Dionysian builders who inherited the knowledge um, from the knowledge that was found at, uh, at uh, originally by Hermes and comes down through the mystery schools. And so this was the antediluvian building knowledge that was used to build things like the pyramids and you know, Machu Picchu and um, Stonehenge and all of the great sort of megaliths around the world. But if that knowledge has traveled through time, why is it we have lost? We have lost it because quite clearly, you know, we couldn't replicate Stonehenge if we tried or, or the Great Pyramid. So where did... Where did it stop? Where did it stop being passed down generation to generation to generation? Yeah, it it, it, it kind of grinds to a halt, not instantaneously, because you have these great builder guilds like the Dionysian builders, and that knowledge gets, sort of gets weakened. And it happens through wars and through the, the royales that are the king's and are continually through their rivalries destroying each other and destroying things that are in the great libraries that are um, destroyed within the war of the losers. losers. And it's not till you know, times like Alexander uh, where they start to say, hey, we want to, we want to make sure we don't lose all of this knowledge. And so like he has, um, Barossus commissioned, or the four, after Alexander, I guess, with the four kings with the split up, Barossus is going to write down all of the history, and he's got original tablets of some of the original early post uh temples. And over in Egypt, you're going to have the great library of Alexandria set up, and then that gets destroyed in a great fire. So things like that were destroying that knowledge all the way down through history and, and left amount of that knowledge survive so that when the Knights Templar began excavating uh, at Jerusalem in um, after taking the city in 1099 they're going to take find things that they're going to take back with them and some of that is some of the building knowledge not all of it but some of it and it's going to be translated once it's back into France and from there the Templars take over the Mason building guilds and they teach them the new technology of building that we see uh, manifested in the great Gothic cathedrals um, that have these huge abilities to have windows in them now and they use all of the stained glass, they have flying buttresses and they are a marvel compared to any other building that would have been built like that you know, for you know, over a thousand years before that. And even would, I would say, dwarf some of the capabilities of the Romans. So you'd have to go back to the Greek Empire before you could see that that knowledge really started to decay in that building capability. I don't know if it was the Greeks or the Romans, but they had the uh, capacity to create cement that would 
that was set underwater. And I don't think we've been able that to replicate the Romans. that. The Romans, okay. Yeah, I, don't think I mean, yeah, I mean we, we get some of it uh, because we have cement, and the Romans were the inventors of cement, um, both marine grade and, um, you know, for normal use. Um, but, yeah, we can't we, – we don't know what that recipe was. And that's, you know, relatively recent sort of history, and knowledge gets lost. What a shame. I mean, and at the same time, all of this military stuff, there there was also the, the, the healing aspects that were going on as well, and that's been lost as well. I mean, it, 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 I, I didn't notice talk of it, but in in all of the, the wisdoms, the ancient mysteries that came down through um, Adam and, and Noah and them, um, there there were healing modalities there that also have been lost to time. Yeah, what's lost on most people is that um, part of the great mystery schools, so whether or not you're talking about Heliopolis or other locations, they were known, and, and, and Heliopolis was known as the therapeutate, where therapeutics comes from, associated with medical knowledge. And so healing and medicines and other things associated uh, were part of the se- development of the seven sciences, and in this case, in the, into the discipline of, of healthcare. And we're not, you know, quite sure how how much technology that they actually had on that. We know before the flood but their ability to do chimera-type beings, that they had the ability to uh, do DNA manipulation before the flood, to create chimera-type things, and also to probably, uh, from the language used in the flood, that the whole land was corrupted versus the sea. Um, That was the Hebrew word shakos, meaning to pervert, destroy, and decay, and words like that, to ruin. And so even after the flood, we get chimera-type beings that are reported in the polytheist cultures. And one deduces they had DNA manipulation. And where I'm going with that, obviously, DNA technology uh, used for whatever purposes uh, and great medical understanding that was lost through time, that was inherited with this sort of bank of knowledge that crossed the flood. So that was a continual decay as well. But again, that's because knowledge in those violent areas were so, was so centralized into one location. If that place was ever burnt down or captured, I mean, just large swaths of human knowledge would have been destroyed. And it's taken us, you know, millennia to, to get back to that same level. Well, I don't think we're even there yet, but I, I, it's hard to tell because with with um, governments and stuff like that, there's so much secret you don't really know what we actually really do have. But with with the, the Nephilim um, settling in in the Promised Land, that was that was basically a slap in the face of God and saying, you know come and get us you know we're not going anywhere and certainly you know when when they when when Israel did finally look and see what the promise where the what was in the promised land they did find that it was inhabited by giants so were the Nephilim war <clears throat> were the Nephilim wars between the Nephilim or were they between Israel and the Nephilim well, before Israel comes along, you're having wars between the different giant tribes um, because that's what they did. They were always fighting for dominance. But they were there also waiting for the nation of hope to show up because that's why they, they illegally squat there. So once Israel leaves Egypt, then the wars are going to be between Israel and the giant nations and their hybrids that are living amongst them. 
and uh, it's full blown war every every battle that Israel is going to fight from the battle of Rephidim and Atharim to the eastern campaign to the central campaign to the northern campaign to the mountain and, and southern campaign is going to be a war against giants and for the most part in the age of Israel they're going to be fighting either beast nations that have royal giants that are trying to take over the world um, as, a, as part of the beast empires and or in around the area of Israel whether or not it is in Syria or it's in Edom or it's in Gaza uh, Israel is going to be warring with the giants all throughout the age of the giant or the age of the judges and the ages of the first two kings of the monarchy, King uh, Saul and King David. Yeah, I, I was fascinated with the fact that David was really a warrior king, and it wasn't until Solomon that you had somebody who was peaceful and more of a philosopher you know, a philosopher, although, you know, he wasn't all that clean either. Yeah, he became corrupted uh, in, his, in his later ages through the marriages that he participated in with treaties uh, with other nations, and they led him to worship uh, Balim gods. So even you can have as much knowledge as you want in this world, but you can still be, be uh, led astray. And with David, he was the warrior king. Solomon was the priest king. It's like the two aspects of the Messiah um, uh, uh, that were being reflected in the first two kings of the uh, Judean bloodline versus Saul as the Benjamite bloodline that are reflected. And what's interesting is that, you know, David was selected because of what was in his heart. And he's still not able to be the one who's going to be permitted to build the temple. He's the one who unites Israel. He's the one who builds its nation up to an empire. He's the one in his first major deed after uniting all of Israel goes and takes Jerusalem as the city and sets up the place where the Holy of Holies can be and where the temple is going to be, but he's not the one permitted to build the temple because he has so much blood on his hands. It's not that he won't have this terrific part in the future because he does, but he, God is wanting another king who isn't going through all of that uh, war and blood on his hands to build the temple because it's a reflection of where God's going to dwell and it's a reflection of how Jesus is going to rule, which is why it's such a sad thing that Solomon becomes corrupted. And because of that, God raises up some adversaries for him from the bloodlines of the giants. And so the details are really kind of important to to sort of understand here. And David is going to be with Jesus, with Jehovah of the Elohim, at the front of the exodus in the end time. That's how how high David is held, that King David and Jehovah, the Lord, is going to lead Israel after they've awakened in second exodus to the wilderness. And yet he's not allowed to build the temple. And yet he's probably the greatest hero of, of Judaism from a strictly human perspective. And such a important individual but yet just like Moses was not permitted to go into the land of the covenant it's a, it's it's a high calling and a high standard well and it's it's it sounds not fair this is your calling this is what god wants you to do and you do it to the best of your ability and once you've done it god says okay you know, now I'm going to put somebody else on the throne because now you're all bloody. I mean, it's... Well, the, the thing is, there's, there's, there's reasons for it. So the reason for Moses is when, when he commanded the water out of the rock without inserting God's name for the authority, he overstepped his um, authority. Um, with David, 
he has some issues as well. I mean, he's intermarrying wives, and he also kills the husband of one of the wives that he's going to take as as a wife as well. And what's and and what I cover off in book two is is the one where it really almost costs Israel the Judaic uh, Messianic promise is when David makes a treaty with the king of Geshur, who's King Telmai, which is the patronymic name of a giant of the Anakim in the time of the Exodus of the three kings there, the giants, uh, is uh, Telmai, Sheshai, and Ahiman in Hebron. And so he makes a treaty and takes a wife named Maka, which is a matriarchal name, and the Maka theme are another tribe of giants, um, just as you have a Maka theme that is one of David's mighty men, because there was a few mercenaries in there. And the Maka theme lived by the Geshurites up in the Mount Hermon region in the land of the giants, as it's talked about in the Old Testament. And that Maka produces Absalom. And then Absalom is going to having is going to have to flee Israel and he goes and takes his hiding place in Geshur, where Talmai puts them in a conspiracy to go back to Israel. And in that conspiracy, he's going to try and overthrow David and take the Judaic throne. Now, what's interesting is now you would have had, if that succeeds, you have Absalom, who is the son of a Geshurim giant that I talk about in book two as giants as opposed to unexplained nations in book one and they've created a new dynasty just as the Amalekites are created through Eliphaz and Timna, Timna being a Horim and Eliphaz is the son of Esau brother of Jacob and they create the Amalekite hybrid race that's going to live in the Petra region amongst the Amalekim giants who they received the name in an eponymous sort of way from the tribe for the name Amalek as being the son of Timna and Eliphaz. And it's the Amalekites who are waiting outside for Israel to come out of Egypt when they are not even trained in war and they're going to try and wipe them from the face of the earth so that they can inherit the inheritance that Jacob was given that they say and the Bible says he tricked Esau who Esau is the father of Eliphaz um, uh, from receiving the inheritance the blessings and the Messianic promise and by Old Testament law if they had wiped Israel from the face of the earth they could make claim to those three important things that go along with the inheritance. You have the inheritance, the blessings, and the Messianic promise, and you would have had another dragon messiah um, attempt to take over that bloodline, just as the Absalom case is a case where it was that perilously close that you could have had a hybrid giant on the throne of Israel, and everything changes with that. So David made some mistakes as well. Well, yeah, I mean, he did take, uh, he was told to burn everything and kill everybody, and he didn't because of his friendship with this uh, ruler. Well, not quite. Um, So there's, in the Holy Covenant um, that was set down, um, and it would apply to the kings as well, and the Holy Covenant, they were to remove all of the people and all of the giants from the land of the covenant. And it's in Deuteronomy uh, 20 and in Deuteronomy 7. And there's two separate sort of explanations in terms of the guidance of war. One is called the going to war edict. The other one is driving out the nation's edict. And you're not to marry any of the wives or keep the spoils within within the land. Outside the land of the covenant is a different story. And different rules apply. So even though not proper, he didn't. David didn't violate the holy covenant because Geshur was outside the land of the covenant. 
Well, I mean, you know, it's funny. You think back to those times and you think how primitive they were, and yet they actually did have laws of war, rules of war. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which doesn't make sense. Well, well, and, it's war. well, again, one of the interesting rules was that if you didn't want to have a great slaughter, you would send out two champions to, to do uh, a battle. And this was common in Greek history as well um, and, and in other nations. And so when we're first in- introduced to David, you have Goliath parading before the Israelites saying, send out King Saul um, and we'll do battle, and whoever loses, their nation will be subjugated to the winner. And it's, it's the exact same thing in the way things are done that's uh, told throughout Greek history. And that's when David arrives on the scene, and he's just barely a teenager by by the, by the details, and he's going to take on the greatest warrior since the flood. And he is uh, six cubits and a span tall. He's 11 feet, three inches tall. (laughs) He's stout. So a two to one height to risk ratio, he'd be five to six feet wide, fully muscular and the ideal warrior. And David's going to go attack him with with the slingshot. It's just an unbelievable introduction for David's uh, um, narrative. Well, you know, it doesn't, you stop and you think. You've got these two huge armies and obviously men in in charge, generals or whatever you want to call them. And so how does this teenager get selected? Because if he loses, that makes Israel subservient to um, the other side. How how, it doesn't, that doesn't make sense. You know, if I was, if I was a, a, a soldier, I'd say, wait a minute. If this kid loses, I'm going to be in servitude for the rest of my life. Let's think this over again. You know, um, it, 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 how does that happen? Well, in this case, King Saul already knows he's lost favor um, with God and has been told that by Samuel. So whatever is giving him additional strength and, and guidance, likely through the Holy Spirit, uh, he no longer has, and he knows he doesn't have it. So he's not able to be quite the same warrior he was before. And he lost this stature and was told his family would not continue to reign on the throne because they did not wipe the Amalekites from the face of the earth. And mm-hmm. uh, And so that was what cost him the monarchy. And so... Um, and he didn't follow God's instructions as what he was told after he was king and going into the battle. So a number of things are stacking up here. So he knows when David comes along that this is the this is the next chosen king. So he could be looking at it from two different perspectives. <laughs> I suppose a he's going to live. He might be a vassal king. He won't be killed by Goliath unless he goes down to the duel. So Saul says. One of two things he might be thinking, this is my speculation, is that one is I recognize he has the power of God and will send him on his way. And if he doesn't, well, there goes my rival to the throne. So he may have had uh, a good reason for, for sending David. But, um, you know, David is no match for this, this giant at the time, but he has a slingshot. And a slingshot, what most people don't know, is one of the most deadliest weapons you could have an accurate it was way more accurate than shooting an, an arrow and you could get in closer uh, to the target. So what's really interesting in the details uh, of this is that um, this happens after 40 days and 40 nights and nobody is wanting to fight Goliath for obvious reasons from the Israelites they are absolutely in fear and the humiliation is just a stain on all of Israel, the first king, and this is what's happening. And so David selects five smooth stones. And what's interesting about that is is if God was with him, he would only need one stone. And God would ensure 
that that stone would, would kill him. But he took five. Why five? Well, you have the five city pentapolis, uh, five kings, and Goliath, I think, is the king of Gath. Uh, he's a Gittite, and he's replaced by Ashish after this battle, as Ashish shows up afterwards as the king of Gath. So I think he's the king. And you could have, he, David could have considered he had four other kings he was going to have to fight of the other kings of the Pentapolis. Or he could have considered that Goliath has four other brothers that were probably all there as well um, that he would have to take on if he killed Goliath. So he took um, the five stones for one of those two reasons. And so the the first shot hit Goliath's head in the forehead and it put him down. But He's Raphaim. He's the son of a giant, Rapha. And so he would have had healing power. Yeah. And if that wasn't enough to, you know, the only way you can kill a giant is cut the head off to make sure and do it so that they don't have time to heal themselves. So what does David do? He walks up there, grabs Goliath's sword and takes his head and shows it to the Philistines and to the Israelites. And if he didn't, yeah, that, Goliath yeah, probably that. gets up or comes later and kills David or tries to kill David uh, because he would have had that healing power. So it starts to make some sense and that he thought there was going to be other giants he was going to have to kill. Yeah, that did that did get to me. I wondered if it 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 because it didn't say he it, he was killed. He said he went down, and so it was like did it knock him out? Obviously, and then he got his head cut off. Yeah, you know, while well, he was still out, but um, yes, yeah, that, that typically was... a stone to, to to the forehead at that time it was a death shot. So, but whether or not he was fully dead, we don't know. But David was going to make sure he didn't heal himself. No, oh, clearly, yeah, and and then <laughs> then the army just took off. So yeah, they were totally. The, the, well, the Philistines had had long history with Israel throughout the age of the judges. So they saw the power of some of those judges like Samson and others, and they knew if that power was with David, they were not going to stand a chance. Unbelievable. How long did it take them then to basically finish the job as far as, you know, killing all all the people they had to? Uh, Israel? Yeah. Yeah, so you're going to have about 400 years of the age of the judges. You've got the period of the conquest. um, And then you've got the age of, you know, King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. So you're looking at a period of about 900 A.D. using biblical chronology to uh, 1450 uh, when that would have started. So you, you, you've got 550 years to clear those giants out of the covenant land area. Did, did Israel ever have a time of peace? I mean, it just seems like these people have been fighting since the, they became the, the a The only age, age of peace, yeah. Yeah, the only age of peace that Israel had was the period after David had subdued all the enemies, including the Philistines, uh, and that Solomon came to power and was ruling until he became corrupted from the wives, from the biblical accounting of it, to follow and worship and make statues and images and idols of, of the gods within Israel. And then war came back. So, again, it's one of those things where if you follow God with Israel you're, and follow the laws of the co- Holy Covenant, you're going to get the blessings of the covenant. But if you violate the covenant, you get the curses of the covenant. And so having nations war with Israel come from the curses side versus if they were to continue in, in um, following God, they would have had peace. So all throughout the age of the judges and with the kings, 
Well, let's stick with the judges. And through the age of the judges, you have the backsliding of Israel, nations attacking them, raising up a judge so they're free. Then you have a revival. Then they backslide, get attacked by another nation, raise up another judge. That's the, the ebb and flow of the blessings and the curses. And finally, God runs out of patience with the northern kingdom. And in 721, you're going to have them dispersed by the beast empire Assyria. And Judah is spared because they repent. Again, we still have all the, the curses and the blessings of the covenant. Then you have Judea backsliding again after that. So Nebuchadnezzar from the Babylonian beast empire is going to take them off to Babylon. Then they repent, and then the king Persia lets them come back. They build the second temple. They have another age of backsliding. They get invaded by Greece. They continue to backslide. They get an Edomite king, and then they reject their Messiah, and then they get dispersed by the Romans as part of the curses of the covenant for rejecting their Messiah. Our history and their history are interlinked, and it's being played out through the curses of the covenant, and it could have been completely different uh, that things had they played out through the blessings of the covenant, we would have a different history. But even in the curses of the covenant that were under under part under that same consequence of what Israel and Judah did is that Israel will be still reconciled through the curses of the covenant and with their awakening and with the second exodus in the end time in the last three and a half years. It's all part of the Holy Covenant documents written of in the, in the Old Testament. So aside from peace, what are the perks of the covenant? Obviously, you worship God and, and keep his, his, his commandments and stuff. But what is the the benefit of having a covenant with God? Because it seems to me they either get attacked or they attack someone else. So the the well the had aspect... they had they yep. yeah, had ahead. they fulfilled the holy covenant and kept the covenant, then they would have had an age of peace, and the Messiah would have come during that age of peace, and then. There would be a history that we haven't seen that would be, you know, as part of this age of peace, but you would have the rule of the Messiah after he comes that would have the millennium and um, moving off into eternity. So it would have been a lot less painful event for Israel and the world had Israel kept their covenant. And before the flood, if Adam had not, violated the only law that was given him, we would have had a whole different history as well through the blessings. So is what's happening today part of a broken covenant? I mean, is I, I mean, the, the state of Israel yes. seems yes. to be in constant when, battle. When, when God established his holy covenant um, in the time of the Exodus, and before they went in to take the land of the covenant that God had gifted them, he had set it down. You have two paths, the curses or the blessings. Uh, either way, through the curses or the blessings, I am Alpha Omega, and we're still going to get there. But I'm going to leave that to be played out through your free choice. And I'm going to be patient with you. But there's going to be a certain point on the violations of the covenant where if you continue, you're going to be um, taken from your land and spread across the whole world uh, until the end time when I bring you back. So you have two choices, fulfill the covenant or go through the curses. And unfortunately, we're still going through the curses of the covenant. I, I was going to say, it, it appears, I, I'm wondering if the military of Israel today has the, that in mind as they respond to attacks rather than making attacks. Yes, Israel was never there to start wars. It 
doesn't mean some of the kings after Solomon in Israel or Judah may have not have started a war because some of them did. That's not part of the covenant. That's not what they were to do. They would be protected if they if they fulfilled the covenant. And I think that still resonates with them today that they're allowed to defend themselves just as they were allowed to defend themselves in ancient times, but you're not allowed to become like the other nations. And, and so they respond. But we may... And we may be starting to see that, and, and I'm not in any way diminishing Israel in any way that we know is the modern Israel, and they certainly have the right to defend themselves, but oh, yeah. they've kind of adopted a Samson concept as well, that never again will they be totally dispersed and, and destroyed, that they'll take down their enemies with them um, if they have to, which is the Samson part, and that's not part of that covenant, so... But I'm not saying they shouldn't defend themselves. Um, there will get to be a point where they can't defend themselves anymore um, before the second exodus. And uh, in the Gog War, the Joel 1 and 2 War, the Revelation 9 War, God will fight for them. This is before the midpoint of the last seven years. But God will not let them be destroyed from the face of the earth. It's going to be fascinating to watch because you see it going on today. And, you know, yeah. just wondering it's... if they, you know, are, are, are they so politicized that they're not paying attention to a covenant that has been there for thousands of years? Well, not every Israelite is a monotheist. Uh, you have a lot of polytheism, a lot of secularism in the Judaic uh, mosaic today. So um, there's different factions, just as there was different factions of the priesthood in the time of Jesus between the Essenes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, which you know had some overlap on their beliefs, but had widely different sort of beliefs. So yeah, they may be they may be losing sight of that to 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 a certain degree. Um, what we do know though is that they believe they're in the Magianic period, and uh, I think there's good good um, reason for that. Whether or not they have the timing right or not, but you know they have the prophecy of the ten jubilees that ended in 2017 that. Um, puts them in the Messianic period. So they're looking forward to the temple and their Messiah from coming, maybe too much so, and looking improperly for what that Messiah should look like. And if that sounds familiar, that's what happened with them with Jesus in his time of coming, and he didn't come the way that uh, they wanted yeah. him to come, so they rejected him. So um, they should learn from that, I hope, for and not fall for the Antichrist, but the Antichrist is going to provide them that peace treaty uh, in the last seven years, and that they're going to provide for, for their protection. So they, they, they ought to be uh, careful as, as, as they move into this Magianic period, and I think we're in the fig tree generation too. In in Old Testament prophecy, the northern kingdom, the lost tribes who have not awakened yet, uh, were called the vine in prophetic allegory. And in prophetic allegory, Judah is the fig tree. Just before Jesus goes into the temple and gives the prediction to overthrow the temple and uh, the prediction of Jerusalem being destroyed, and then immediately after that, uh, the disciples ask him about his coming and the signs of the end time. And in that oration, he talks about this fig tree generation. He goes up to this fig tree at the start of where I said, just before he goes into the temple, and he eats from the fig tree, and then he kills it because he says, this fig tree no longer bears fruit. And he knows his time is coming for the crucifixion. He knows Israel is going to reject their Messiah and violate the covenant, and they're going to be dispersed. And so in the fig tree generation, as part of the overarching signs, he says, when you see the fig tree that's in bloom again, um, you know, this is, this is the generation where all the things I just said in the order that I gave them to you will be fulfilled. 
heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. He's that strong on this. And Israel, or, you know, isn't, is the northern kingdom as we understand them in the Old Testament, and Judah is the southern kingdom. So the vine, Israel, is not awakened yet. But they're going to awaken sometime in this generation and probably at around the start of the last seven years. But the fig tree is back in the land of the covenant. And in 1967, the fig tree also got a hold of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is at the epicenter of biblical Old Testament, and New Testament end time prophecy. So they have to be in control of that for the fig tree generation to begin. So... We may be in that Messianic period, but we don't know how long a generation is. Could be 40 years, could be, uh, which would line up with the Messianic start in 2017 if it's 40 years. But, you know, we're getting um, almost 10 years beyond that. And it may not be the 40-year generation. The Psalm says 70 years for a generation. So that would put us in to starting maybe the last seven years in the 2030s. Uh, or 2040s and so you also have genesis 6 3 for 120 years so we want to be careful i think we're in the fig tree generation i think these events and the nations that are conspiring to wipe them from the face of the earth um for nations that take their royale bloodline back to the same ones they were warring with with the time of the covenant um, but we want to be careful not to get ahead of the the chronology so these are part of the birth pangs, uh, the, the birthing sorrows, which is the, uh, one of the three overarching signs along with the days, days of Noah. But there is an interesting passage in Psalms 83 that's interesting. It's about this uh, covenant to wipe Israel from the face of the earth. So that the, uh, in Psalms 83, 4, it says, it says, Come let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. They have consulted together with one consent. They are a confederate against thee. This is in the time of King David, but I, this transgenerational blood covenant to wipe them from the face of the earth, I think, continues today. And then in verse 6, it says, The tab tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites and Moab and the Hagarines, and the Hagarines are, and the Ishmaelites would make up all, much of the Arab nations of the Muslims, uh, and Gabal, which is another uh, giant tribe of Edom and Petra area and also of Tyr, uh, Ammon, um, which is, you know, Ammon and Moab is on the, on the, on the, on the east side of uh, the Jordan River and the Philistines and the inhabitants of Tyr. So you have Gaza and the Hamas who have the blood oath to wipe Israel from the face of the earth. You have in Lebanon or Tyr, you have Hezbollah, who have um, the oath to swear to, to destroy Israel from the face of the earth. You're starting to see missiles come in from Yemen, which is part of old Edom, as part of that alliance, to destroy Israel from the face of the earth. And then you have the Shia part of the Arabs, or the Persians, in this case as a people, but from the Muslim religion aspect of where Muslim comes out of the Ishmaelites and the Hagarines. Hagar is the uh, matriarch of, uh, of uh, Ishmael and used in Ishmaelites. And there's also a consort of Abraham who also have sort of skin in the game in terms of if Israel, Israel is no more, history-wise, today or future, would they uh, make claim to the Magianic blessing, the birthright, and, and the, the blessings that come with the Holy Covenant that were given to Jacob and, and down to Israel. So these nations are trying to destroy Israel from the face of the earth. They will continue. Yeah. <clears throat> and this will I, I, continue I, I, as we get closer to the last seven years. So it's all the same catastrophes just that different strength as this generation unfolds. Wow. Well, it gives us something to think about. I just noticed the time. Um, Dan, uh, you want to you give everybody it your... It goes your, by in a hurry. <laughs> it does. You, you want to give everybody where they can get you and get your books and stuff? 
Absolutely. So the best way to get hold of me is through my website, the Genesis Six Conspiracy dot com. That's Genesis Six, the number six conspiracy dot com. And on that website, I have a generous excerpt of all ninety eight chapters of Book One and all eighty four chapters of Book Two. And even though they're generous excerpts, it's a small inkling of what's in both of the books, as those books are loaded with information. You won't believe how much information is in those books. And if you want to get a hold of me, there's a contact the author. If you wanted to get a signed copy of the book, you can go to the Buy Now page for either book. And there is, I live in Canada, so there's a Canadian page. There's a U.S. page. And if you live anywhere else in the world, there's an international page. You can also link over to Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, and BarnesandNoble.com. And you can also link over to get the digital version at Amazon for both books as well. There's a Kindle link to go right to the Buy uh, from Amazon to get the digital version. And book one is available on Audible, and it's getting good ratings, and uh, people like the style of the reader. And I encourage people who have been waiting for the Audible version to go pick up a copy of that or get it downloaded. I guess there's a better way of, ter- of buying it. But that's the best way to get a hold of me and or my books. Wow. And next week we'll be back with Section 4, And I want to thank you, Gary, so much. This is, as always, an enlightening show and leaves me with more questions than answers. So so we'll take another stab at it next Monday. So thanks so much, Gary, for being here tonight. It's time for today's Lucky Land Horoscope with Victoria Cash. Life's gotten mundane, so shake up the daily routine and be adventurous with a trip to Lucky Land. You know what they say, your chance to win starts with a spin. So go to LuckyLandSlots.com to play over 100 social casino-style games for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Get lucky today at LuckyLandSlots.com. No purchase necessary. BGW Group. Void or prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. You're at a bar looking for a new beer when you smell a citrusy aroma. It smells like sunshine and oranges. You see the bartender pouring a beer that looks refreshing. Only one problem. You have no clue how to pronounce the name. Jialai? Is that even English? The bartender is now heading your way. As you're about to order an ice cold Jialai, you hear, Can I get a highlight? Highlight. The best beer you probably can't pronounce. 